Please be seated. Wow, look at all of you tonight. So I'm very pleased to see so many of you. From all eternity, our Lord chose this day for you. The invitation went out to many, but you came. Others have good reasons for not being here. They're doing God's will wherever they are, but you are here. Therefore, God had planned from all eternity this day for you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, he prepared this day for you so that you could get closer to him. And as the sick came to Jesus for healing, and he relieved them of their illnesses, of their crippledness, of their blindness. He cast out demons. He transformed their lives. So he will do the same thing for you tonight. What will he do? Will he give you a, a new kind of enlightenment so that you see things perhaps that you had never seen them before? Will he console your broken heart? Will he give you the sense of confidence in his mercy? Will he give you trust in him? Whatever he does for you tonight, it will be very good. Because from all eternity he had planned this for you. Our Lord invited you, you came. Our Lord is now outdone in generosity. So even as we speak, Jesus Christ in the Eucharist is doing something in your soul. And he's refreshing you. And he's bringing you closer to his sacred heart. What will he do for you? Who knows? Perhaps you won't even know until eternity. But whatever it is, you know that it will be very good because he's not outdone in generosity. You give him an hour tonight, hopefully not more, and he will reward you immensely, immensely. He called you here. You are here, and he will finish his work in you more and more tonight. So, thank you for coming. I'm very happy to see you. But Jesus Christ is infinitely more happy to see you because God has created your soul, your whole being, for himself. And you console his sacred heart tonight by spending time with him. So that being said, the theme of our mission is divine providence. And I'll begin with a little explanation about divine providence. The providence means plan, essentially. It comes from the word providere in Latin, and that means to look out for, to see forward to, to take care of, so God created all of creation, and not only did he will their being, he desired their being, but he willed their being, and it made it happen. But he also willed that they end up in fulfilling for what they are created. So in other words, he with them from beginning to end. The rocks go to the center of the earth. Gravity pulls them down. That's the nature of the rock. And even if something prevents them from going further, well, they go down as far as they can go. The birds build nests. They don't go to bird school for that. God created them an instinct, and they fulfill it, and they fly beautifully, at least most of them do. And they have little birds. Okay, they fulfill for what they are created. 
But you and I, far more than that. Yes, we exist. Yes, we take nutrients from the earth. We, we have physical being. We are like the animals in that we can move and we have emotions or we can have children and so forth. But you and I are given an intellect and will. So from all eternity, our almighty God has created us for himself so that we could respond with our intellect and will so that we can love him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength not by instinct but by choice to choose to love is one of the most beautiful gifts that there can be and God created us and he has a very special plan for us too just like he does for the rocks and the birds and all of the rest of creation but he has a very special plan for you. He has a very special plan for you. He desires that you grow in holiness so that you may be with him forever. So God has a plan for all of us, that is to keep his commandments, that is to follow the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, he created us so that we could do charity for one another. But he also, that's all of us together, but he also has a very particular plan for each and every one of you according to your state in life and your vocation in life. A very specific one. And in that divine plan includes your blessings, like your family, your friends, the food on the table, the fact that you can think, the fact that you can walk, the fact that you can uh, study, the fact that you, have, you can play sports, whatever it is, God gives you all of those abilities. Most of all, he gives you the life of grace in your soul, a share in God's own life, so that you can be sons and daughters of God. It's one thing to be a creature of God. But it's another thing to be able to participate with God in a loving communion. What a gift. Yes, all those blessings he gives to you. And each to you according to your vocation and state in life. But he also includes in this plan your crosses. Those difficulties in life that he allows to happen with his permissive will so that you and I do not become too attached to this world. Suffering somehow reminds us that this isn't the place to be. Our end isn't here, it's in heaven with God. And so when the world isn't right, it's a little bit easier to love God as he is numero uno. Okay, so God allows our suffering and he allows different sufferings for different people. We don't all have the same exact suffering. Many of us have similar ones, but you have the very own particular suffering because God has allowed them for your particular needs and for my particular needs. And why does he allow all of that? Because he loves us. He loves us. Because in his divine plan, he is there with us through the whole thing. He doesn't just create us and wind us up like a clock and put it on the counter and watch us go. That's not the way it works. God is involved in every detail of our life. Trusting in God. I'd rather trust in his plan than mine. Because I'm awfully broken. I have the effects of original sin and I am a sinner. And I have made many wrong decisions. So whose plan am I going to trust? Mine or his? It's a no-brainer. But I have to be reminded of that every day. That's why it's important to pray every day, because it puts things in perspective. So that is divine providence for you and for me. There's a whole lot more, but that's the essence I want to give to you about it. Now, in God's divine plan for you and for me, 
I'm going to talk about three categories. The first one will be the things that God in his divine plan does not want you to pursue. Things that he wants you to hate. Things that he hates. The obstacles that are going to prevent you from getting to him. That's one category. That's the one we're going to talk about tonight. Okay? Those things God do not want for you because they will hurt you. And they will take you away from him. And they will make you more in darkness. And they will make you love less. And they will make you uh, more in coldness, okay? I think you know what this theme is about. The other category is the things that God wants us to have a holy indifference about. Whether I'm healthy or sick. Whether it's hot or whether the weather is comfortable. Whether I have delicious food or whether I just have food. Okay. One or the other could go either way, but God wants us to have a holy detachment from certain things. So there are certain things that God wants us to hate and certain things that God wants us to have a detachment for. Doesn't mean we don't love those things, but we're willing to let them go if God wants us to let them go. And then the third category is those things that God wants us to love and to pursue with gusto. What does God want us to follow? What does he want for us to do? So tonight, we begin with those things that God wants us to do without, to hate. So, I hate to tell you this, but I need to find my glasses. I think, I think they're in the sacristy. <laughs> I would like to say I'm detached from my glasses, but I really need them. <laughs> Can you please stand for the gospel? A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you. Jesus heard that the Pharisees had cast out the man who had been blind. And having found this man, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this, and they said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you are saying we see, so your sin remains. So there is one thing or two things, that God does not will in his divine plan for you. And that is sin. He does not want that through his antecedent will for you. 
and for that matter, anything that will lead you to sin. There is one thing that opposes God directly, and it is sin. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines sin as any action, word, or deed that offends God or is disobedient to God. Now, we have free will, and this is part of divine providence, because if we didn't have free will, we could not choose to love. God eternally chose to love us, and when he chooses, he chooses for good. So it's not that God ever stopped loving us. We can reject that love. We have a free will. And by that very fact that we have a free will, sin will sometimes happen. But it still opposes God. God can make a greater good happen in spite of sin. In fact, he's doing that all the time. But if we sin, we still go against God. And if Father Joel persists in his sin, especially serious sin, and does not conform his way, does not repent, if he hangs on to his sin and dies without repentance, he loses salvation and he suffers from eternal fire. So guess what the greatest enemy of us is? It's sin. And not just other people's sins, my own sin. And so I have to admit my sin. St. John says that anyone who says he does not sin makes Jesus Christ a liar because Jesus Christ has died for sinners. We are all sinners. We need his mercy. You know what? Um, when we were growing up, we didn't want to look at our sins. We wanted to look at everybody else's sins. They're the problem, right? So we had this nasty habit of pointing at other people. And my mother noticed this and she said, children, do you not know that when you are pointing to other people, you have three fingers pointing back at you? So it was a deep lesson for us, and we learned a very important lesson that changed our lives completely. You know what we did then? <laughs> <laughs> but we had to look at me, right? That sins all my fingers have to turn in to myself. And I have to say, okay, I am a sinner, and I need God's mercy. So sin affects us in different ways. I think the way to describe sin is to look at what the sin of Adam and Eve did. When Adam and Eve were created, they were created not only with original justice and their mind over matter, they had right reason, and their, their lower desires, their passions were all under the harness of right reason. They were controlled. Their will was strong enough to choose what was right. But they were also created in sanctifying grace, which is a share in our Lord's own life. That grace was everything for them. With that grace, they could live in holiness, a live in participation of the life of God, and they could have this holy communion with the Blessed Trinity. But when they disobeyed God, that was all put to a halt. And when they lost grace, they lost everything else. They lost harmony with the universe. They lost that protection uh, of safety. They would die. Their interaction with each other was darkened. You know, when, when our Lord was looking for Adam, and uh, he said, who told you that you were naked? 
And then, and then our Lord said, oh, you ate of the apple then, and I told you not, or not the, the fruit. I told, I, I told you not to eat of the fruit, and you ate it. And what did Adam do? My wife, she gave me the fruit. So already division among people. And of course, what does Eve do? Well, the devil, he made me do it. So it's like nobody's willing to take responsibility for their sin. So this sin has really affected them in a very bad way. And all the other evil entered into the world because of this sin. All poverty, suffering, murder, war, disease, natural disasters, everything you can think of that is evil was caused by this one sin. Just one act of disobedience to God Almighty. And this sin not only uh, put Adam and Eve out of harmony with the whole universe and each other and cut them off from God, but it also darkened their minds so that they couldn't see the truth of what it is. You know, um, just a small example. Let's say that I took a cookie from the cookie jar and engulfed it. And my mother knows that there's a cookie lust. And she says, who took the cookie? And of course, nobody's home but me. And I still deny it, right? My mind's darkened. I, I, I just I make excuses for myself. And I refuse to acknowledge the truth. And then even if I'm caught with the truth, well, say, well, I thought it was left there for me, okay? I make excuses, okay? So our minds become darkened by sin. And that explains why there's a lot of untruth out there, especially in the world, because if there's so many people in the habit of sin, so many people are willing to tell lies. And so many people are willing to shut their mind off when they don't want to see the light of truth. That's an effect of sin. Sin also strengthens, it loose, uh, weakens our will. So when I sin, my will to do good becomes weakened. I become a little less uh, fervent. I become cold. If I commit a mortal sin, I've really cut myself off God completely. And it's very hard for me to be of strength will, a strong will to get up again. And then also, when I sin, the lower desires of my soul, my passions, my impulses, my emotions, a little out of control and they pursue different things, some things that are unlawful. And sometimes they pursue even things that are good, but there's too much of it or not at the right time. Okay? We call that the lower desires of our soul. So our passions, our emotions are scattering around like wild horses, no harness to control them. And the will is too weak to say no to them, and the mind is darkened, we're in a pretty sad state with sin. See, my sin not only affects me, but my sin affects you too. Do you remember when we say the prayer, the confidior before mass? I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, because I have greatly sinned. Why do we do that? Why do I confess to you my sins? All of my sins. Well, you know, it's like if I have private sins, nobody sees them. And what they can't see can't really hurt them, right? Wrong. I confess to you, my brothers and sisters, because my sins hurt you. They don't just hurt me, they hurt you. How do they hurt you? Well, number one, just as Adam and Eve sin caused disharmony in the universe, caused poverty, caused natural disasters, caused all of that, so my sins participate in that. It has similar effects. 
So if there's a hurricane in Florida, I can't say, well, God's punishing the people in Florida because of their sins. No. God allowed these natural disasters to happen upon the world because of our sins. My sins contribute to the hurricane in Florida. I confess to Almighty God and I confess to you, my brothers and sisters, because I have greatly sinned against you, even my private sins, those sins that nobody knows about, they affect you. How else do my sins affect you? You and I are members of the body of Jesus Christ. We are his hands, his feet, his heart. Okay, we are his body. And we are the vessels and the veins that transport the blood throughout the rest of his body. Okay? Look at it that way. Now, if I sin, then either I lessen the life of grace that is supposed to flow through me by the power of Jesus Christ to you. So if I sin venially, that little vessel gets a little clogged. So not as much blood of life gets to you, the rest of the body members. So my sins affect you. And if I commit mortal sin, I cut off the blood completely. That is, any life of grace that's supposed to flow from me to you by the power of Jesus Christ. So it's like I'm a dead member and I am not contributing any good to you. That affects you. So I confess to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, because I have greatly sinned. And finally, my sins affect you in this way. Every sin that I commit, I become a little more proud, a little more selfish, a little bit more wanting of my own way, self-willed, and sooner or later this comes out. Archbishop Fulton Sheen, he, he, uh, he compared hidden sin like the big boulders in the field, or the big field stones that are in the field. Eventually they surface. So I think, well, nobody sees my sin, it can't hurt anybody, hide, hide, hide. Sooner or later it comes out. It comes out in me. Because every act of disobedience against him that I do affects me. It makes me more selfish. It makes me more angry. It makes me more self-willed. It makes me colder, less loving. And that affects you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. So. I confess to you because I have greatly sinned against you. That's why we don't want to sin. Sin has all so many bad effects in us. And it hurts everyone else. And most of all, it either lessens our love for God or it cuts us <coughs> off completely from God. Is that anything? we would want to have to do with. So I'm watching TV. Oh, there's an interesting scene. Kind of exciting, but the problem is it's immoral. Do I stay on it or do I turn the channel? Or do I even maybe just click off the TV? You see, every time I indulge in my own little self-will, it's easier for me to sin and therefore I can affect everyone else from those hidden sins. That's why we struggle to be perfect. That's why we struggle to overcome our sins, not to be complacent with them, not to say, well, nobody sees them, they don't affect anybody. No, our sins hurt. They hurt ourselves, they hurt others, most of all, they offend God and they break the sacred heart of Jesus. They break his heart. This includes venial sin. Not just mortal sin, which separates my soul from God, 
but even the venial sins, the quote, little sins. Okay? Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene in his book, Divine Intimacy, says this about venial sin. While venial sin does not destroy charity, it, it is opposed to charity and therefore diminishes its vigor and fervor, hindering its development. This is the disastrous effect of deliberate venial sin committed with the realization that it is displeasing to God. So sin, even venial sin, eventually stacks up, and while a million venial sins do not equal one mortal sin, venial sins still pave way for mortal sin. They make it easier for me to fall into mortal sin. And so I should be struggling to overcome venial sins. That's hard. That's the whole life we try to do that. I'll tell you a story about what sin does. It's in the Old Testament. I believe it's in the, the book of Kings. Um, remember uh, King Ahab, that awful king of Israel. And his wife's name was Jezebel. And King Ahab was looking out across his neighbor's vineyard. And his neighbor's name was Naboth. And he looked at this vineyard and he says, I want that vineyard for me. So greed, I want it for me. And I'll do whatever it takes to get it. All right, it's already paving way, paving way. He goes to Naboth. And he says, you know what? Sell your vineyard to me, and I'll give you twice its worth. Or I'll give you a better vineyard. And Naboth said, but this vineyard has been in my family for centuries. And it's the treasure of our family. I will not sell it to you. Ahab gets angry. Okay, greed, anger is building up. And then he goes home and he pouts and he doesn't eat. And his wife Jezebel says, what's bothering you, Ahab? And he says, Naboth won't give me his vineyard. And she says, some fine king you are. I'll take care of this. And so she writes a letter to all the elders of that territory of Israel. And she trumps up a charge against Naboth saying that he has cursed his country, and his king. And the elders gather around. They all get the letter. Ahab seals the letter for Naboth's death. He's charged falsely, and they stone him to death. And now King Ahab has his vineyard all to himself, so he goes over to possess it. So greed anger, murder, and coldness of heart as if nothing had ever happened and he goes to possess the vineyard. My brothers and sisters, that's what sin does to our soul if we don't try to root it out. Here is the problem. Okay, One more comment I want to make about this is that worse than sin, worse than my sin, is my refusal to acknowledge that there is sin or my denial of my sin. Because if I sin, if I'm honest about it, at least I can repent and be forgiven by Jesus Christ. But if I don't acknowledge my guilt, I'm too proud to admit my sin, I put stone walls around my heart and I do not allow Jesus to forgive me. That's the worst state that I could be in. So worse than sin is the denial of sin. You and I need to do the best we can to inform our conscience, right? In the gospel, Jesus says, uh, well, the Pharisees were saying, see, uh, are we blind too? And Jesus says, you're not blind. If you were blind, you would be guiltless. But because you see, you are guilty. In other words, they're deliberately blind from the truth. 
They weren't blind in the sense of not knowing better. They did know better. But they chose to remain blind to the truth. That's the worst place anybody can be. Tribes are far guiltier than someone who could have not known better. They are not obeying their conscience. Now this lack of good conscience is described of the Romans by St. Paul. It makes them more uh, away from God. He says, while claiming to be wise, they knew better. Because they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the likeness of an image of mortal man and of bird or of four-legged animals or of snakes. So they sacrificed to idols, even though they knew better. Therefore God handed them over to impurity through the lust of their hearts for the mutual degradation of their bodies. So again, hardness of heart will lead to even worse, worse, worse sins. Our conscience is not merely our personal perception of the truth. It's not merely our, our feelings. The word, the expression, follow your conscience, is often most misused. It is true, we must follow our conscience, but that doesn't mean follow what we want to do. Conscience is a moral law of God written in our hearts. It's subjective, it's not just our subjective feelings. Some think follow your feelings, but this is false. Rather, follow the moral law written on your heart. That didn't always feel good, by the way. Doing the right thing doesn't feel good sometimes. It involves sacrifice at times. But if we are ignorant of the moral law, we truly are ignorant, but we know that something could be true, but we don't want to look for it, then aren't we guilty of not wanting to know the truth? So what happens if we are ignorant of the truth or ignorant of what the church teaches? What should we do? We should ask. We should read, find out. Conform our conscience to the teaching of the church. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says this, in the formation of conscience, the word of God is the light for our path. We must assimilate it in faith and prayer and put it into practice. We must also examine our conscience before the Lord's cross. Do we examine our conscience every day? Do we say the act of contrition every day? We are assisted by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, aided by the witness or advice of others, and guided by the authoritative teaching of the church. So we should conform our conscience to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Church. To knowingly oppose the teachings of Christ in this church is to be blind to the truth. We seek, we try to find out, we try to know the truth. The Catechism says, ignorance can often be imputed to personal responsibility. This is the case when a man takes little trouble to find out what is true and good, or when conscience is by decrees almost blinded through the habit of committing sin. In such cases, the person is culpable for the evil he commits. So those are hard words. Those are very hard words. Now I give you the good news. Father Joel is a sinner. That's not the good news. <laughs> but Father Joel is a sinner. And he is weak. And he knows what's right and wrong. He tries to be holy. But out of weakness, he falls into sin. And he knows that the sin is his greatest enemy. It's worse than poverty. It's worse than death. It's worse than disease. It's worse than the COVID. Boy, we're all scared of the COVID, aren't we? But in our society, are we scared of sin? Or do we try to flee from it? Sin is worse than that. 
So what do I do, knowing that I'm a sinner? Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. So no matter how many sins I've committed or how serious they were, our Lord Jesus Christ beckons me to come to him, to kneel before him and say, you are God, forgive me. Our Lord wants to forgive so much. He wants to forgive you and me more than you and I want to be forgiven. Far, far more. So he is waiting to forgive us. He is longing to forgive us. And not only to forgive us, but to heal our souls, to bring us refreshment in life. But here's the other problem. Father Joel isn't just a sinner, but he sins every day. <laughs> the book of Proverbs, the just man falls seven times, though he rises again. So what does a just man do even though he falls seven times? He rises again. So we come to the feet of Jesus. We embrace his sacred heart. And we say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. <clears throat> Do you remember that parable? When the Pharisee came into the temple, Oh, Lord God, I thank you. I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week. I tithe much. And I'm not even like this miserable tax collector. Pride, pride, pride. But the tax collector wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven, beat his breast, and he says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he goes home justified, renewed in grace, because he was repentant. So what do we do when we fail? We get back up and we say, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's why we say the act of contrition every night before we go to bed. That's why we examine our conscience every day. I know that if I examine my conscience, honestly, I'm sure I could find something that I could have done better or something that I offended our Lord with. But there you go. Lord, help me. I love you. Forgive me. And we get back up and we strive again. Every day, little by little, Jesus Christ gives us the grace to persevere and to become a little holier, a little holier, a little holier. And that's exactly what he wants for you. And that will be your joy. So yes, even sinners can have hope. Even sinners can be joyful. We just need to be repentant sinners. Every day. Every day. One last comment. When you go to confession for a thousand mortal sins, every one of those sins are wiped away. If you confess the kind and number of them, if you can't remember how many, just give a rough estimate of how many in terms of mortal sin. I can't count all my venial sins. There's way too many of those. But for mortal sin, I should try to remember roughly how many times. But if I confess them, Jesus Christ wipes the soul clean. He wipes away every sin because he loves us so much. And he plans that day of our repentance. And he will finish his work in you and me. That is the good news, my brothers and sisters in Christ. St. Therese said this, and she was wonderful. The little flower, sweet girl. Okay, uh, and she said, if I committed a thousand mortal sins, I would still run to the feet of Christ with great confidence that he would forgive them all. St. Therese, if a saint says that, if Jesus Christ says, forgive your brother, 
Not seven times, but 77 times, seven times. Okay. If our Lord commands it, will he not do it? Our Lord loves you. And he wants to forgive you always. But a friendship with God is a two-way street. We can't just say, well, God will take care of everything. I don't have to change. That's not the attitude we're supposed to have. We're supposed to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And let's say that every day. That's not a command. It's just advice. Or we could say the act of contrition every day. Either way, okay, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the good news. Our Lord desires to forgive and he desires to heal. In the sacrament of confession, your sins are not only forgiven, they are healed completely. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, the bad news is how bad sin is. But the good news is that sin becomes powerless in the presence of Jesus. And he can conquer it. And he can wipe it away. What joyful news. I'll close with this story. Unfortunately, it's not a good story. I have a friend whose sister-in-law asked him all kinds of questions about the Catholic faith because she wanted to join the Catholic Church. He told her all he knew, including the moral teachings. She was surprised at some of the moral teachings, so she discussed it with the local priest. When the sister-in-law talked to the priest who was supposed to receive her into the church, the priest told her, don't talk to your brother-in-law anymore. Don't talk to him about the faith, because if you learn more, you will be held accountable for more from a priest. The priest was in error, for he was condoning a form of deliberate ignorance. May we never seek easy, lukewarm spirituality. May we form our conscience according to the teachings of Christ, and may we do all we can to reject sin. And if we fall yet again, get up. Say you're sorry, say I'm sorry and reject sin again. In the very back on the table, there's some examination of conscience. And this is what some might be tempted to do. That's not a sin. The church needs to get up with the times. Don't do that, okay? These are according to the commandments of our Lord and the teachings of his church. These are the ways of Jesus, uh, or these are, the sins are against the ways of Jesus, but this is what he would say. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, examine our conscience. Look, sometimes it's not easy to look at. I don't like looking at my sins in front of my eyes and say, whoa, I didn't even think about that. But it's the beginning of the healing. I confess my sins to Jesus, and he heals me. He forgives me, and he heals me. And he will complete his work in us. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this has been the hardest night. So please, come back tomorrow, okay? Don't be scared of tomorrow, because it's a little bit easier tomorrow. But, but these are the things in God's divine plan that he wants us to flee and to hate. Sin and anything that leads to it. May you and I open our heart to him and may we allow him to flow in because that will be our true joy. God bless you. I'll be in the confessional after benediction. Again, as long as there are people that need to go to confession. Thank you.